Thanks, Jeannie. Um, and uh, sorry about the technical issues, everyone. I'm Cecilia Wong. My pronouns are she, her. And let's get back to David. So, you know, we've been talking about the fact, and everyone's been talking about the fact that um, the Supreme Court has a 6 3 supermajority, as our, our title for today's uh, webinar said. But that hasn't really played out, as I think you might have mentioned with Jeannie, in 6 3 decisions. What, what do you see any patterns in? what the, the difference was between the 6-3 conservative majority, if you just look at the lineup, and the 5-4 decisions we got, which justices were key in um, keeping the court from going 6-3 on various issues? So, you know, I, that's a great question. I think, again, it, de it depends on the case. Um, but certainly, in, um, Roberts, Kavanaugh, Barrett, uh, in, in important cases this term joined with the liberals. Um, Gorsuch did as well. In some instances, Thomas joined with the liberals. I don't think Alito ever really joined with the liberals unless it was a unanimous decision, but, uh, but, but, but pretty much everyone else did at least once or twice. Um, and really when you look at the term, there are, there, you could count on one hand the number of six to three decisions. The vast majority of cases were decided by by very different uh, uh, voting alignments, very, very mixed up voting alignments. So there was a case that we filed an amicus brief in this term on the computer fraud uh, criminal statute that would, that would, if the court had adopted the conservative government position, uh, have made it a crime for people to access a website and violate the terms of use that that website imposes, which nobody even reads. Uh, and the court rejected that six to three, but the six in the majority were the three liberal justices and the three Trump justices. And uh, Justice Barrett wrote the decision. So it just shows you, you cannot write anyone off uh, on this court at this point, um, with, with the possible exception of Justice Alito on uh, many, many, many cases. Great. One minute left in this session, David. We'll bring in a question from John H. in Morrisville, Pennsylvania. Do you expect this court to continue handing down narrow decisions, maybe in order to reach those those five four um, rulings, or do you think things might change over time? Well, they you know that is certainly the way that the court um, you know sort of avoided partisan decisions this term was often by deciding cases narrowly and leaving the, the, the more controversial questions unresolved for this case. And so, you know, we'll talk about some of them came down 8-1 or, or, or unanimous, some of the most controversial cases by deciding the cases narrowly. Will they continue doing that? You know, they might. Um, Chief Justice Roberts is a, is, a, is a champion of this notion of minimalism, which is that the court should decide cases on the narrowest possible grounds. One of the things about deciding cases on the narrowest possible grounds is it makes it easier for more people to agree who have different worldviews. That's ultimately a good thing for the court. Uh, it's not a good thing for the court if they uh, are seen as deciding everything on partisan lines. And so I think there will be institutional interests that will continue to drive them to try to decide cases narrowly. But as we'll talk about at the end of this uh, session, um, there are some pretty big cases coming up for next year that are going to be very hard to decide in ways that don't divide along partisan lines. So next term might be the real test. We'll come back to you shortly, David. Right now, I want to bring in my colleague. Um, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, Sophia Lynn Lakin, um, Deputy Director of our Voting Rights Project. Her pronouns are she, hers. So Sophia, you are joining us um, having just returned from testifying before Congress on the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Before we get back to the Supreme Court, tell us how did the testimony go and what were some of our goals um, in, in the federal legislation that's moving right now in Congress? Yes, thanks Cecilia and thanks for all of you for having me. You know, it's a really positive sign that Congress has called so many hearings on voting rights and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act in particular. And I was really honored to just to be able to testify as to 
basically why it's so important for Congress to act and pass this really critical piece of legislation since the Supreme Court in Shelby County versus Holder gutted a key provision of the Landmark Voting Rights Act eight years ago, the Voting Rights Project has been pretty much on the front lines. We filed or opened more than 80 cases and investigations to fight back against really an avalanche of voter suppression that came at us since Shelby County. We filed over two dozen cases in 14 states just last year and have already filed two cases in Georgia and Montana so far this year. But, but what we know from our experience litigating in the trenches is that this kind of case-by-case -case litigation, fighting back against one restriction at a time, um, only to see it pop up again someplace else if you're successful, this is not not an adequate way to combat the threat that we're seeing to the health of our democracy. We really need stronger voting rights protections at the federal level, including a restoration of the so-called pre-clearance regime that was gutted in Shelby County. That's the requirement that would have the places with the worst records of discrimination in voter, voting have to get approval from the federal government to ensure any changes they want to make to voting laws don't curtail voting rights and to get that approval before those laws can be implemented and taint elections going forward. So the restoration of this preclearance process is one of the really crucial aspects of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And we, we, you know, Congress really needs to act here and our supporters can really help by pushing their representatives to get this done. To the Supreme Court. Tomorrow we're expecting the last two cases of the term to be decided, including a potentially very significant voting rights case out of Arizona. Bernovich, Bernovich versus the Democratic National Committee. What's at issue in Bernovich? So this case is on the surface about two relatively narrow practices in Arizona, whether ballots cast at the wrong precinct will be counted and whether people can volunteer to assist absentee voters to return their ballots to elections officials. And the narrow question in the case is whether limiting those practices in Arizona violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits voting practices that discriminate on the basis of race. Section 2 is one of the main tools that we have to combat voter suppression since the Shelby County decision that I mentioned before. So the Ninth Circuit said, based on what we have before us, the evidence we had presented, that Arizona's limits on these, these practices did in fact violate section two, and the Supreme Court took up that case. I think most of us watching this case expect that the Supreme Court will reverse the Ninth Circuit and say that Arizona's limits on these two practices does not violate section two of the Voting Rights Act. But you know, we're all holding our breath to see tomorrow. What we're what we're hoping holding our breath to see is how precisely the Supreme Court does that. It's possible that the Supreme Court could rule very narrowly and say simply that, you know, based on the very specific facts of this very specific case, that there isn't a section two violation, or the ruling could be broader and make it significantly harder for voting rights advocates like us to challenge racially discriminatory laws under the Voting Rights Act. Um, I, either way, we will continue to bring cases and challenge voter suppression, but a broad ruling could really undercut yet another piece of the Voting Rights Act. Um, the court could, for example, say that in order for voting rights advocates to win these kinds of claims, that we'll need certain kinds of evidence that can be extremely difficult to obtain or to prove. We filed an amicus brief in the Supreme Court urging against an approach that would do this, that would curtail the scope of Section 2. And we argued that this was really inconsistent with the purpose and the original intent of the Voting Rights Act, which was to root out discrimination in voting, no matter how subtle. Either way, the fact that we're really concerned about this case and it has the potential to really upend the, our ability to enforce Voting Rights Act, that speaks again to the need for all of us to really press Congress to act to provide stronger voting rights protection. The, the um, interesting things and alarming things about um, the briefing and the Brnovich case and the argument is that 
some of the uh, petitioners, the governor of Arizona for one, were really pushing um, for an interpretation of the Voting Rights Act in Section 2 that was a, that's ahistorical, right? They're, they're arguing that if it's kind of a, a neutral, race neutral um, time, place and manner restriction on voting, that states kind of have free reign um, to, to institute all kinds of policies that make it much harder for people to vote. And even if um, those kinds of policies really disproportionately affect people of color, in this case, uh, members of the Navajo reservation, for example, overwhelmingly um, res you know, resort to having someone help a neighbor or someone who's gonna go off reservation to mail in their ballots. Um, and, and this policy, one of the two policies at issue would forbid that. So can you talk a little bit about why um, those petitioners' arguments are so off base if you look at the history and the text of the Voting Rights Act? Yes, absolutely. That's the critical point that many of the laws that we see on their, on their face don't say only white people don't need to show voter ID. They don't, they're not so blatant on their face. They're racial, they're racially neutral. So for example, a literacy test or a poll tax, these on their face are racially neutral. And yet, as we know, despite their popularity, um, which was another basis of the petitioner saying, look, if a law is very popular, if most states have them, then this probably means it's fine. Um, we know that those practices have been designed very purposely for the for, for the fact that they burden disproportionately voters of color and that they've gotten more sophisticated, more subtle over time. And the point of section two uh, of the Voting Rights Act really was to try to root that out, to try to get behind um, these neutral practices to see what is it doing in practice, who, you get, who is getting swept up in these kinds of laws and to adopt an approach that sort of looks blindly at the face of the law really, really ignores the fact that this country, unfortunately, has a very long history of using these kinds of tactics and very sophisticated and more so over time to prevent certain voters from being able to access the franchise. After the historic turnout of the last presidential election uh, last year, state legislators have introduced over 360 voter uh, suppression bills in 47 states. Um, and a record-breaking 28 of those new restrictive laws did pass. And the year's not even over yet. So we're fighting that battle, as you say, Sophia, both in the courts and in Congress. Hopefully we'll get some relief in both fora. Um, and with that, I'll thank you. And we're gonna bring David back on now to talk about the First Amendment. So David, last week, the Supreme Court handed you and us at the ACLU a great victory affirming students' free speech rights in a case that you argued in front of the court. Um, I think this case is really likely to be an extremely consequential one in that it shapes how students' First Amendment rights play out in our modern world, a world of social media and online learning, um, as the opinions make clear. So first tell us about uh, Mahanoy uh, School District versus BL and what it means for off-campus speech, whatever that is these days. Sure, um, uh, I, I, I'm happy to talk about the case, but I think um, we actually have a little uh, video here where our client, uh, Brandy Levy, uh, talks about uh, how the case came about. So can we play the video? When I was 14, I made a Snapchat post on a Saturday night saying F school, F cheer, F softball, F everything. I got kicked off of the cheer team and they tried to suspend me from school. I was upset. I was really, really upset. My family sued because they thought that it wasn't right that I could get in trouble for something that I said out of school and not during school hours. I feel like if I win in this case that it'll help students and it'll make them realize that they have their own freedom of speech and that they're allowed to use their freedom of speech. When I was 
All right, so um, I, we're, we're told that the audience could hear that, so <laughs> we don't have to re repeat it. Uh, so Brandy, uh, Brandy came to us, uh, at, came to the ACLU Pennsylvania affiliate um, and, uh, and said um, that uh, she, she, she and her parents objected to the fact that she had been kicked off the uh, uh, cheerleading team for a year for having uh, sent out a Snapchat on the weekend to her friends expressing her frustration uh, with uh, a number of uh, decisions that had gone badly uh, for her. And, you know, I think all of us who, who, who have been high school students have had days where uh, things have gone badly for us and we've expressed that frustration to our friends. She happened to do it on Snapchat. Uh, it was designed to disappear within 24 hours. It didn't disappear because somebody took a picture of it uh, showed it to the cheerleading coach. The cheerleading coach um, uh, responded by kicking her off the team for a year, even though she did it uh, on the weekend on her own time while hanging out at a local uh, cocoa hut in uh, in Mahanoy, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, uh, and so, so we thought it'd be a relatively simple case. Uh, this is clearly an overreaction. Uh, certainly students should be free to express their views outside of school without the principal coming down on them uh, as if they're sitting in class. Uh, and so the ACLU of Pennsylvania wrote a demand letter and thought that would be the end of it. That was not the end of it. The school fought this case all the way to the Supreme Court. We won in the district court. We won unanimously in the Court of Appeals, but they got the Supreme Court to hear the case. And the question that was presented um, was whether schools should have the same authority to regulate student speech um, outside of school uh, as they have inside of school when that speech somehow has an effect on the school environment. And the argument that they made was, look, in the internet, uh, you know, it's, it's in the internet era, there's no clear boundary between inside and outside school and things that kids say and do on the internet uh, outside of school can, can, can come back to the school environment and really interfere with the ability of the school to teach. Uh, and so they are argued that the Supreme Court should give them the same authority the court has given uh, to school authorities inside school when they're uh, outside of school. The court rejected that um, uh, eight to one uh, with, um, uh, uh, with an opinion written by uh, Justice Breyer uh, saying, you know, it's very different when students are outside of school. Uh, it's different for, he said, three reasons. The first one is that when kids are in school, the school is their supervisor. They are under the school's uh, control. Uh, and so the school obviously has broad authority to regulate them. When they're outside of school, outside of school activities, outside of school supervision, it's their parents who are in control. So if Brandy's parents objected to what she said, they could take action against her, but the school shouldn't be um, interfering. The second thing he said was that, you know, if kids had the same speech rights outside of school as they have inside school, they would have, there would be nowhere that they could speak freely without worrying about a principal second guessing what they have said. And it would interfere with their ability to engage in both, you know, open expression of their frustrations, as Brandy did, uh, criticism of the school, which in some sense Brandy's tweet, uh, uh, Snapchat was, uh, political, religious speech, and the like. And then the third thing Justice Breyer said for the court, for again, for eight members of the court, was uh, that schools actually have a, an interest in teaching students the importance of free expression because it is so critical to our democracy. And the way they teach it is by modeling tolerance. If you model tolerance for kids, then maybe kids will learn uh, that the tolerance is actually an important and critical part of our democracy. And so um, uh, the court uh, affirmed the decision uh, uh, decision below and, and really sort of created um, significant protections for young people's speech outside of school by rejecting the school's uh, attempt to try to treat kids as if they're in school 24-7. It was a really inspiring passage, I think, in, in Justice Breyer's opinion, um, where he talks about um, all of our obligations to 
foster um, democracy and the connections between free speech and democracy. Um, last question before we uh, turn to the next segment. Um, we've experienced technical difficulties on this call. Uh, what, what was it like to argue the case in the Supreme Court during the COVID pandemic um, and via uh, telephone, I guess? Yeah, so yeah, it's all by telephone. So, you know, some things are are, are, are easier. You know, my, my, I didn't have to put a suit on. I argued in my shorts and a t-shirt and, and Birkenstocks. Uh, uh, and, um, but you know, you, you, you can't, you also can't see the people that you're speaking to and they can't see you. And that really, um, makes it more challenging. One of the ways the court has responded to that challenge is that by changing the way the argument is structured. So ordinarily in an ordinary argument in person, any justice can, interrupt at any time and ask a question and you will get you know uh 30 40 50 questions in 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 a, in, a, in your in your time up there uh, answering you feel like you're a ping pong ball just getting you know bounced back and forth by by uh, all of the justices in the um covid context they give they each take about three minutes per and they have that they have you for those three minutes and you have them for those three minutes and so these there's only one justice who can interrupt you when you uh, are answering a question so in some ways you get to have a more um more conversational like uh, exchange uh, because you can't get interrupted by everybody else on the other hand it's it's much harder to get a sense of where the court is because every justice knows that they're going to have three minutes to question each side. And so they get prepared and they have their questions and they ask hard questions of each side. In the ordinary, in the, you know, the, the, the real world uh, arguments, no justice has any, you know, guaranteed time. And so when they come in, they, you, you, can, you can glean from when they come in and why they come in, where, which way they might be leaning, much harder. So I walked out of that argument. I walked out of my, you know, my uh, my study uh, after that argument with, you know, no way of knowing, uh, you know, whether we would win or lose the case, what the vote would be, uh, and then, uh, and you know, and then we come to learn that we won it eight to one. Uh, so uh, whereas I think if it was an argument in in person, I would have been able to walk out of the court with a much better sense of where the court was. But I wouldn't. Right, because part of same. every normal. Um, and part of the of every normal Supreme Court argument is hearing the justices talk to each other, right? So we we missed out on that, uh, have missed out on that during the the pandemic. On the other hand, we have heard Justice Thomas's voice a lot more than ordinarily we would. Absolutely, yeah. Um, thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to switch now to my colleague Louise Melling, director of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Center for Liberty at the National ACLU. She is going to talk to us about the Supreme Court's decisions impacting religious freedom and the right to be free from discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Louise, hello. Hi, Cecilia. Hi. So Louise so is pronounced by talking about her, I should say. Sorry about that. Um, Louise. Louise's pronouns are she and her. And we're going to start off, Louise, by talking about another of the big uh, civil rights and civil liberties cases this term, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. Um, many people, of course, this case involved a Catholic um, foster care agency contracted with the City of Philadelphia, um, whether they uh, could lose their contract with the city because they discriminate against gay couples um, who want to serve as foster parents. Many people don't know what to make of this Supreme Court decision. Is it a win? Is it a loss? Can you start by telling us um, what were the issues in the case and what does it really mean for LGBTQ people's equality? Uh, sure. So this is a case that was closely watched. This was a case closely watched because of its implications for LGBT rights. This was a case closely watched because we were all curious whether this would be an occasion where the court would speak about whether institutions that object to complying with anti-discrimination laws are entitled as a matter of constitutional law to an exemption. 
that matters tremendously, for example, for LGBT rights, because as I say, if you if you are if there are many exemptions granted, the protection against discrimination starts to look like Swiss cheese rather than a blanket to sort of afford you protection to be welcome into society. This case was an occasion that David has referred to big questions, narrow decision. You could see that right away when you learned that there was no dissent. Nine justices concurred and in, in agreed with the judgment. The majority opinion written by Roberts, joined by the liberals, as well as Kavanaugh and, and Barrett. You've teed up you know, like what the facts were. I just want to say, look, this is a case where Catholic Social Services came in and said, we're entitled to this contract, even though we won't agree with the terms. We won't comply with the terms. And we're, if you require us to comply with this contract, it's a violation of our rights to our free exercise of, of religion. And what we say in the office, sometimes when we talk about these cases, what they were really arguing for was a constitutional, they were saying the constitution protected their right to discriminate here. So big, big questions and very, very narrow ruling. The court did not address that question about the, whether the Catholic Social Services had a constitutional right to exemptions, sort of broadly if it objects to anti-discrimination rules. It also didn't address another question that was important in the case that made people really watch this case, which is whether the court was gonna change the test by which it judges whether or not free exercise has been violated in cases. Instead, what the court did was it issued a decision that rested on a term in the contract that the court interpreted to give the city discretion to decide whether or not to grant an exemption to the non-discrimination rules. And the court said, if you have that discretion, then this rule isn't neutral and generally applicable, which is an important test. Is this law neutral and generally applicable? And where your law isn't neutral and generally applicable, city, you have to come forward with a compelling state interest to justify the fact that you didn't grant this exemption here. And the court said, you can't do that because there's no reason if you had this authority, to re you haven't offered us a reason why it would be legitimate for you to give somebody else an exemption and not give Catholic social services an exemption. So in that way, the decision is, the decision is really narrow. Um, as with many narrow decisions where the question remains, um, the issue is what's ahead for us. And I'd like to talk about sort of where I think the court might be going, if it's, if it's all right with you, after we talk a little bit about the COVID cases, the COVID cases that raise religion issues. Before we turn to the COVID cases, Louise, um, is there any action that our members can take um, to help and support LGBTQ rights? Is there any uh, congressional legislation going on right now? Sure. I mean, it's a great question because what's important is, you know, I think lots of people think of us as the ACLU, the people who run to court and sue the government to protect our rights. And we do do that. And we're incredibly proud of that. Um, but what we also really want to do is be using all the tools available so as to advance people's, in this instance, people's equality. There is a bill pending in Congress, the Equality Act. This would be a bill that would be enshrining in federal law, federal protections against discrimination based on, among other, um, sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as cleaning up a few other issues around sex discrimination. Incredibly important bill, incredibly important to pass. So when you get those action alerts, please do go forth, please do take action. We need you to, to help us succeed in this. Go to aclu.org slash action to get more information about the Equality Act. So Louise, let's talk about those COVID cases. Um, this term, the Supreme Court made a number of decisions on its so-called shadow docket that um, had to do with COVID restrictions on religious gatherings. So first of all, can you explain for our members, what is this shadow docket and how did those decisions by the court affect religious freedom? Sure. So the, the shadow docket refers to those cases that are where the court issues opinions or, or orders, but those cases haven't been fully briefed and subject to argument. So they aren't cases where the court has gone through its normal process. There's a petition for cert, an opposition, and the court decides whether or not it's going to hear the case. These are cases that typically come to the court on an emergency basis where people are saying, court, we need you to act while our case is, is developing in the courts below. We need you to act to protect our rights. We need you to act to issue an emergency order so as to prevent harm. 
So what we saw were a number of occasions where houses of worship went to the court and said, we need emergency relief from this, from this COVID restriction. What's interesting, there's a couple things that are interesting about these cases. So one is, um, this is a case unlike many of those, these are cases unlike many of the cases this term where personnel actually did matter. When, when Justice Ginsburg was alive, the court more often in these cases was pretty deferential to the, to the states and cities that were issuing restrictions and didn't grant, didn't issue orders in joining the government from enforcing its COVID restrictions. After Justice Barrett um, came on the court, the court did in, then issue a series of injunctions, in particular many um, running to California's restrictions that it had on, on gatherings. Um, so Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts went from being the, in the majority to, to the dissent in, in some of these cases. There's one decision that the court, one opinion the court issued, Tandon, that has gotten quite a bit of attention in this context. And in Tandon, it's a decision where the court, that's common, um, referred to by many commentators as the case in which the court granted most favored nation status to free exercise claims. And here's what was at issue in Tandon. Houses of worship objected to a rule that said that if you were going to have worship in your house, no people from no more than three households could come to your house to meet for that. What was true was that there was a rule that applied more generally that said if you're having any kind of gathering in your house, this, that same restriction applied. So in that sense, it looked as if religion, gatherings for religion were being treated the same as comparable uh, gatherings. But what the court said was, oh, no, there are these other gatherings that we view as comparable where non-religious activity is 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 um, subject to fewer restrictions and it pointed to things like shopping like going to retail stores there aren't the same restrictions on who can gather in these other in these other places and businesses the lower courts had said these you know retail is not comparable to a home gathering you're you're moving through faster etc cetera, etc cetera. but the court said if there's if there's any other comparable secular activity where there's more freedom, then this is, this is a violation. This is not an order of the same, it's not a decision like a decision after the court's heard everything, but it is still the court opining about what it's thinking about the status of free exercise claims. So when we look at the, the rulings in those cases and the rulings in Fulton, what we see is you know, serious questions going forward about what the court is going to say in these cases that where there are challenges posed um, on behalf of religious entities say to the requirement that they comply with non-discrimination laws. When is the court going to see discretion as it did in Fulton so that it's going to say, it's going to rule in favor of the objecting institution? And what is the court going to think of as comparable as it tries to assess whether or not there's impermissible discrimination in the court's mind against a, a institution that's motivated by, by religious beliefs. The questions are just, they're, in, they're incredibly important. Um, and I'll say that it's really a great privilege to work on these questions from the ACLU because the ACLU is bringing to these, these questions concerns about anti-discrimination rules as well as a deep commitment to religious freedom and religious liberty. Um, and out of those kinds of conversations in all of these cases, what we've really stood for is a, is a proposition um, that free exercise gives you a right to your beliefs, but it doesn't give you a right to harm others, including by discrimination. I'll flag that there are two cases now with petition. What? Go ahead. Sorry. Go see. No, uh, let's two cases with petitions for cert sitting before the Supreme Court. So we may learn a lot more about the court's thinking really very, very soon. One is a case, Arlene's Flowers. This is a case of a floral shop, which says it's a violation of its religious freedom if it has to comply with a non-discrimination rule. In that case, they refuse to sell flowers to a same-sex couple for their wedding. The other case is a case called Minton. And in that case, the question is whether the hospital had a right to refuse to provide a hysterectomy once it learned that the hysterectomy was for a transgender man. Thanks, Louise. Um, this is, as you say, an incredibly important area of work. And personally, I'm really proud to work in an organization where you and 
and so many others are doing it. Um, we'll bring you back in a moment to talk about a case that all of us um, are very concerned about, the Mississippi abortion case. Uh, but for now, we're going to let Louise go and bring David back. Um, here's your three-minute lightning round, David. Uh, what are some of the other de important decisions from OT20? Um, talk about some of the criminal cases, the, the other case remaining for decision tomorrow, Americans for Prosperity, and the ACA case. Right, so uh, Americans for Prosperity, we'll, we'll learn about tomorrow, um, as indicated earlier, that's about the right of, uh, of people to donate to charities like the ACLU anonymously, um, a very important uh, uh, case. Um, the, the ACA case was uh, the, the third uh, attempt by critics of the Obamacare to strike down that statute in its, uh, essentially in its entirety, uh, and this time, the first time they tried to do that, they lost five to four. The second time they tried to do that, they lost six to three. Uh, this time they lost seven to two. Uh, so uh, the, the, the uh, Obamacare is, 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 uh, is getting stronger and stronger in the public eye and uh, not coincidentally stronger and stronger in the, in the Supreme Court. They reached a seven to two vote again by deciding the case narrowly and finding that the, um, the uh, plaintiffs who sought to challenge the law uh, didn't actually suffer an injury that allowed them to have standing uh, to sue, but their analysis suggests that no one would have standing to challenge to make the challenge that they were making, so I don't think that challenge will uh, succeed in the future. And then on the criminal cases, really pretty surprising. I mean, uh, there are uh, six good criminal uh, rights cases from the court, two involved interpretations of statutes where the United States was arguing for very broad interpretations of criminal laws and the court said, no, uh, we, we read them much more narrowly in favor of criminal defendants. Two of them involved um, the privacy of the home, whether there were exceptions to the warrant requirement for uh, police going into homes. In both cases, the court essentially unanimously um, rejected the lower courts that had found that there was there were categorical exceptions in certain contexts where police could go into homes without a warrant. Uh, and then two cases involving police abuse. Uh, one, a George Floyd-like killing, uh, except it, where, where they knelt on the, on the person's back until he died, um, uh, except in this case, the person was shackled in a cell. Uh, and the Eighth Circuit found that the, uh, the um, prison officials had qualified immunity. The court summarily sent that back in a decision joined by uh, the liberals and Justice Kavanaugh and, uh, and I believe Justice Barrett. And then there was a second case involving police shooting uh, in which the question was, does the Fourth Amendment restrict the police's ability to shoot somebody to stop them? Uh, when the person doesn't actually stop. They hit him, but he doesn't stop. Is that a seizure that is governed by the Fourth Amendment or not? The lower courts had said, no, it's not. Uh, the court, uh, again, with two conservatives joining the liberals, uh, said that it is. So um, pretty good term on criminal defendants' rights. There were a couple of uh, not, not so great decisions, but, um, but, but you know, I think many more positive decisions than anyone would have expected. Okay, let's turn to the forecast for next term. David, stay with me and let's bring Louise on. So as we already said at the top of the hour, the Supreme Court's term um, was very important for constitutional rights, but next year, OT21 is shaping up to be even more full of hot button issues, including abortion, gun control, and affirmative action. So Louise, um, as promised, can you talk to us about this Mississippi case, what's at stake? Um, and let's answer a question from Joan T. in Aptos, California. What What do you see as the best possible and worst possible outcomes in Dobbs? Um, I'll just say, everybody pay attention to this case. This case, this is the first time since Roe versus Wade, since 1973, when the Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case that involves a ban on abortion. Um, this case comes out of Mississippi. It's a ban on abortions after 15 weeks. The court took up the question whether um, it is the case that all pre-viability abortions, whether bans on pre-viability elective abortions are necessarily unconstitutional. Uh, that, 
that question would un, undo a fundamental proposition of Roe versus Wade, which is that every pregnant person has a right to decide to have an abortion before a viability. So stakes are high, no question. Best result, um, I mean, worst result, court overrules Roe. Um, in that case, we think abortion would become illegal in, in 20 states or so. That's not a result I, that I'm betting on. Uh, court could uphold the 15 week ban. Do not underestimate what that means. That means the court has overturned a fundamental proposition of Roe. That means very serious harm. Many abortions that are legal today would become illegal. Greatest impact on people not of means who struggle to raise the money, get to a provider. People who learned later in pregnancy about a condition with the fetus, people who had changed circumstances in their family, whatever it is that means that people have made a decision later to seek an abortion. Best result, the result, of course, that should result, is that the court strikes the Mississippi ban and reaffirms the fundamental principles of Roe, recognizing that we now have 50 years of precedent. People rely on this, and this decision is fundamental to equality. Thank you, Louise. Um, we'll keep an eye on that case, of course, and we'll bring back David. So besides Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, what are the other major civil liberties cases we're following for next term? Thanks. Um, yeah, so first, just on Dobbs, I think, you know, in some respects, what we what we would hope for is something like Casey, uh, where 20 uh, years ago, the question was, should Roe versus Wade be overturned? There were five justices on the court that had suggested that they thought Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided. Uh, and, and nonetheless, the court blinked and reaffirmed the core of Roe. It cut it back somewhat, but it reaffirmed the core. Um, you know, that's what we have to hope for now, because there's certainly a, num a number of justices, six justices on the court, that if Roe were coming up today would not decide it that way. And the question is whether they will um, be constrained by the precedent. Um, the, the second big, big, big case that they've uh, already taken is a case coming out of New York City um, about um, the New York uh, state law that requires people to show a particular need um, in order to get a permit to carry a concealed weapon in public. The court um, some years ago in 2008 uh, uh, interpreted the second amendment of the constitution to protect the right to possess a gun in your home. Uh, struck down a DC law that prohibited the possession of guns. Um, this is about the right to carry guns in public, uh, you know, a, a right that um, uh, would ha has, has much more se serious implications for a public order, for public safety, um, for uh, the character of our, uh, of our streets, of our cities, uh, and the, the, the vulnerabilities of, of people who live in them. So uh, that's a huge, huge case. The court, I think, will probably say there is a Second Amendment right to carry a weapon as well as to have one in your house. Um, but I think the, the, the question will be whether New York's restriction is a reasonable regulation of that right. In the Heller case, which uh, was the first to announce a right to, to uh, possess arms, the court said that um, the right is subject to reasonable regulations. So um, this is really a uh, uh, a huge, huge case. And then a third case that they have not yet taken, but very well could take, uh, is a challenge, a, a con essentially a constitutional challenge to Harvard's mm -hmm. uh, affirmative action uh, program, uh, in which the challengers are, are, are arguing that Harvard uh, takes race into account, um, uh, advantages certain uh, uh, minority groups, and disadvantages in particular um, uh, Asian uh, applicants. Uh, the, the Harvard won in the district court and won in the Court of Appeals, uh, but this is a court that is, um, uh, has, uh, I think, six justices who are uh, very likely hostile to affirmative action, uh, and the, the, mm -hmm. um, the challengers have asked for the uh, Supreme Court review. We won't know till the fall whether the court's going to take it, but if it takes it and it has in one term affirmative action, abortion, and gun rights, uh, it's going to be a very, very big term and a much harder term for the court to decide cases in narrow ways that avoid partisan divides uh, than this term was. David, let's throw in a question uh, from the YouTube chat. Um, have, will there be any cases next term that have to do with facial recognition and the Fourth Amendment? Any, any sort of petitions to watch or 
ways that'll bubble up in the court? No, I, I, I don't think that's, you know, in, in, order for, in order for things to get to the Supreme Court, they have to go through a, a, dist- a level of district court litigation and court of appeals litigation um, before they get to the Supreme Court. And so uh, the Supreme Court takes on questions way after the culture has started to, you know, address them. I, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, they took on the question of whether uh, the police could search a cell phone when they arrest somebody in public. And uh, ordinarily they're allowed to search anything on the person when they arrest the person in public. Um, but the argument was cell phones are different. And the, 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 the court did say, in fact, that cell phones were different. But in that case, the phone that was at issue was a flip phone because the case had, you know, had, had, had originated in the early 2000s. And so everybody was using, you know, was using uh, iPhones by the, by the time the court decided it, but the court was deciding a case about a flip phone. So I don't think we're gonna see a facial recognition case in the Supreme Court for some time. They, they turned down uh, two requests, one of them ours, um, to review the rules for um, what the government can do at the border with respect to um, laptops and digital devices and cell phones, should they be permitted to search those on the same terms that they can search your luggage, which is basically whenever they want to. Um, uh, The court uh, was asked to take that up this term and it it didn't, and I think it didn't because it wants to see what the lower courts do in in a variety of these cases before it takes it on. Great. You There you have it, everyone. Facial recognition is too cutting edge for the Supreme Court <laughs> to handle. Um, we're going to go to your questions and answers now. Um, we're going to stick with us. We started a little late, so I think we'll go for another six minutes or so. Um, the first question is for Sophia Lynn Lakin from the Voting Rights Project. So, Sophia, a lot of our members who are joining us today are very concerned about the spate of state voter suppression laws and policies. And so, for example, Mary B. from Cheshire, Connecticut and Mary Margaret H. from Decatur, Georgia are asking basically, what are our chances um, of fighting these kinds of state voter suppression laws in the courts? And also, what are the chances that the John Lewis Act um, or H.R. 1, another voting rights uh, law, will actually be enacted by Congress? So those are very good questions um, and ones that we deliberate a lot of times. Uh, With respect to the first question in terms of our chances in court and um, our options there, I think, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the fact that litigation is an important and critical tool, but it's not adequate on its own. I think the last uh, election cycle definitely revealed that for us, um, but I think that is particularly true in the voting rights context. We will see tomorrow when the Brnovich decision comes down uh, precisely how circumscribed the federal court options will be going forward. But look, we've well, we are committed to fighting these laws in court. We will continue to do so. We will respond with every possible tools we have. We've been um, pressing all different kinds of angles that we're particularly suited to bring, First Amendment, um, disability rights, and so forth. So I think we still have a lot of tools at our disposal, but um, again, I would press that this is one tool in our toolbox. And if we've learned anything, it means that our supporters really need to get out the, uh, get on the phone, get out the door, really press their legislators um, to, to enact reforms and to get their representatives to support uh, things like the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Thanks, Sophia. Let's bring in Louise to answer a question from Jessica M. in Roslindale, Massachusetts. Louise, um, do you foresee any um, of the new anti-trans state laws going to the Supreme Court in OT21 next term? I would not think that they would get there that quickly. Those, those, the litigation challenging those laws has just started. And as David explained, we go through the district court, the court of appeals. So I would expect that we'll see, um, we may see litigation in the Supreme Court on those issues in the future, but not in the next term. Opinion um, to throw some water on those uh, state 
legislatures trying to pass anti-trans bills. Um, let's go to a last question uh, back for our boss, David Cole. Um, and here it is. Many, many of our supporters on the call today expressed deep concern over uh, President Trump's appointees on the Supreme Court, um, are, are really troubled by this, what appears to be a 6-3 supermajority on the Supreme Court um, against civil liberties and civil rights, and what that means for all of us. Um, so Peggy C. from Philadelphia asks, is there really any realistic recourse for challenging decisions that fly in the face of the principles and values that we hold dear as ACLU members? So absolutely, it's a, it's a great question. It's a question that you know, we're, uh, we confront uh, every day uh, at the ACLU. And I think um, there are a couple of, a couple of answers. You know, one is the Supreme Court is one forum in which one can defend and advance civil liberties and civil rights, but it's only one forum. There are many other forums. Uh, and, and, and so we look to other forums if we think a particular uh, uh, place is not gonna be so sympathetic. And so we have affiliates in, in every state uh, and in many of those states, their, their state Supreme Courts are much more progressive than the US Supreme Court. And we are bringing cases advancing civil liberties concepts and civil rights uh, protections under state law and state constitutional law. And when you do that in state court, the U.S. Supreme Court can't touch it. Uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court can only decide federal questions, cannot decide what the uh, you know, Missouri state constitution uh, means. So that's one uh, uh, alternative is to go uh, through the states, through state legislatures, through state courts, using state law. But I think a broader uh, sort of perspective says, you know, this isn't all that new for us. The Supreme Court has been a, a, has had a majority of Republican appointed justices since 1972, almost 50 years. And in that 50 year period, we, the ACLU, have been fighting for women's rights, for LGBT rights, for racial justice, for voting rights, for immigrants' rights, and we've made substantial progress. So it was a conservative majority court that recognized the right to abortion, a conservative majority court that ruled in favor of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's arguments for uh, sex discrimination violating the constitution, a conservative majority court that recognized uh, uh, marriage equality, a conservative majority court that struck down the death penalty for juveniles and mandatory life without parole for juveniles. So, um, so how does that happen? That happens because the court uh, is influenced by the, the polity at large and by uh, the community's um, views. And so if they, if, if they see, if they hear, if they understand uh, that a particular right uh, deserves protection from the standpoint of the public at large, it will be protected. Um, the, it's, it's political scientists have studied the court over years and found that the court essentially uh, doesn't depart very far from where the country is with respect to essential values, um, uh, 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 fundamental rights uh, questions. And so the court recognized marriage equality, not because you had five justices who you know, interpreted the, the constitution in that way, but because the country had moved to a point where there was just not a good reason to deny two people of the same sex, the right to uh, declare their loving commitment to each other for the rest of their lives. Um, but that happened through civil society action, through people joining together with organizations committed to values that they believed in and advocating for those values, advocating for them in corporate boardrooms, in public institutions, in university uh, classes, in uh, around the dinner table, uh, in city councils, in state legislatures, in state courts, and ultimately in the Supreme Court. And so, you know, what we can do if we care about civil rights and civil liberties, and I know that everybody who's on this call does, is continue to band together, continue to support those institutions that are doing the work of advancing uh, a vision of civil rights and civil liberties 
that we can all be proud of. And I think it's because of the work that we've been doing with your support over these many years that the court this term, notwithstanding its six to three conservative majority, uh, ended up deciding as many cases as it did um, in support of uh, of liberal uh, of liberal causes. So we just have to keep doing what we're doing uh, and 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 recognize that this fight is about much more than what happens before those nine justices in that uh, particular building uh, in Washington D.C. So it really matters when we have those awkward conversations at the Thanksgiving table with our uncle or <laughs> with the awkward coworker at the coffee pot in the break room. Um, a very exactly. hopeful note to end on while we're all doing this work in all the ways we do the work. Thank you so much, uh, David Cole, Sophia Lynn Lakin, Louise Melling, our ASL interpreters, and Jeannie Cortez for filling in in the beginning of the call. And thank you most of all to all of you who are tuning in. We could not do this work without you. That is literally true um, for all the reasons that we've talked about today. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you soon.